miss one of our shows, you can always listen to it on our website, which is planttalkradio.com, or you can subscribe on iTunes to our podcast and receive that every week and subscribe to that. That's always uh, a convenient way to listen to our program Indeed. as well. Uh, Fred, uh, uh, we were talking about the leaves and gathering mm-hmm. those up, and uh, this is a perfect time of year to start if you don't already have one, a compost pile. It is indeed, Mark. Uh, Based on just this business of the leaves coming down, uh, I have no objections. As a matter of fact, for the the overall masses, so to speak, to push the curb or the the leaves out to the curb, uh, keeping it out of the street, just on the lawn, they pick it up usually uh, so that it doesn't ruin the lawn. And and that is a good use. Uh, the, interestingly enough, then when people go to the city facility or other, they they're paying for their own leaves to be composted and brought back. I like to do my own. Um, I mentioned putting the bag on uh, during the fall, and I will continue to do that uh, to get enough of the the decompostable <laughs> whatever uh, materials. I always keep a bucket under the sink to put, um, well, we'll call it waste from heads of cabbage on through everything green. No meat, no cheese, nothing of that nature that can spoil, smell, and bring in vermin. Uh, And then when you have this blend of some green, some brown in material, it is extremely rare if you move, if you turn the pile at all, it's extremely rare to get any kind of odor out of the pile other than maybe the pleasant one of decomposition. Now, <laughs> rotting protein is, is one kind of thing. <laughs> Decomposing uh, or cut grass uh, along a farm field and so on, those things are, are wonderful. And this is indeed the ideal time because you have the material right there. Um, I, I don't anymore, but I was known to kind of go out through the neighborhood for a while because I was using oak leaves as a mulch in my azalea and rhododendron area. It's not very big, but I wanted to keep a a, a decent supply so that it was kind of like a hillside in West Virginia where there was decomposing oak leaves, slightly acidic in their own part, uh, making a wonderful mulch by lofting up and uh, causing dead air space between leaf parts that actually stop the ground from freezing as fast. Now, the ground will freeze just as deep as it will any place else, but ever so much more slowly when you have a nice mulch on there. So big wood chips, chunk bark, uh, leaves of oak, and everything else for that matter can work very, very well. The only thing I would not try to compost is... Uh, tops of iris that have been have gotten bores in them. I have a couple of peonies that have uh, gotten unfortunately dark black. Uh, they have a, a fungal body on them. Those will go out to the street or in into the collectible um, waste trash uh, anyhow because I don't want to spread those diseases. I have also a couple of patches of uh, uh, well crabgrass and foxtail. Uh, where I didn't get a control down. And I will pull the tops off of those guys so I can throw the seeds away because each mature crabgrass plant, and I have some mature ones, probably puts out several thousand seeds. And even if only 10% of them germinate, that leaves me with a batch. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they, they got away from me this year. But anyhow, uh, composting is... Uh, a big deal or a small deal, and by that meaning space. A three by three by three foot tall area is really all you need. It takes a volume of that much to start the process of uh, wetting, drying uh, organisms, working with the material to break it down. And then some people uh, are, are wish to buy a compost starter at the garden center, and I have no problem with that. It does work. However, if you have anywhere near decent garden soil or or in and around your perennial bed that you've worked over the seasons, if you add that, it's teeming with bacteria, fungi, good fungi, and so on. And all you have to do is blend that in with these new leaves and grass you're putting in there, and it will start the process quite nicely. I have a spot that is three wide. It's uh, 42 high. And then maybe eight feet long. I guess I haven't measured it for a while. But I use one end for the compost pile. Uh, I 
put my bonsai plants, and I will be doing it very shortly, on the ground in the other end of the compost area and, and store them with leaves over the top after watering them really well. <coughs> They'll handle the whole winter that way. I occasionally lose one, but believe it or not, they don't need any sunlight. They're not growing after I put them away, which will be about in the next two weeks. They will be covered and safe from fast freezing and thawing. And then the other side is compost. Then in the spring, when I take the bone size out of there, I start moving the pile side to side. Now, do you have to have a, a compost pile contained, or you do, can you just make a pile? You can just make a pile, Mark. It depends on space. Uh, many of our home sites anymore don't have acreage in the first place, and it would be difficult for them to just let it be space because it takes a mound and it gets bigger, wider, and so on. A mine is trapped in an old fence that is with posts and, and uh, well, hidden from the public's eye. Uh, my neighbors aren't bothered because there's no bad odor. They don't have to look at it. There's a shrub between them and it, and so on. So um, a plain old pile will do it. You can use um, some of the old wood pallets that have been broken up, and they won't sell them again. You can stack those. You can use cement blocks, anything like that, to control the size. And uh, Fred will have his to-do list. And there are quite a few things on it today, so get your pencil sharpened. That's coming up next on Plant Talk. This summer at Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens, the gardens are in full color. Walk amidst tropical and native butterflies in flight in the indoor Pacific Island Water Garden. View the conservatory's bonsai collection and experience the exhibition Origami in the Garden. Find details at fpconservatory.org. It's time to mow a little lower. I set my mower down last time to two and a half inches. I might have mentioned that last week. Fertilizing now, if you haven't done it yet, or if you did it several weeks to a month ago, you can wait into the end of this month or November because where you're not wanting, especially Mark is not wanting to have to keep mowing, <laughs> you, you can make a tremendous difference in what your grass will look like next spring. It it will literally jump into action. Uh, it will have come through the winter better, uh, growing. And, and actually, this, this uh, food source or supply of nutrients will go on into summer so that the fertilizer in the spring can then catch up and take it on from there. It's transplant time, as we spoke a little earlier about the black-eyed Susans and other plants. Be careful right now because the temperatures did get down, at least at my house, at to 40 earlier this week or late last week. I can't remember which. But anyhow, it's time to get the tropicals in. I brought the orchids in. The, the tropicals of various kinds are still out there under cover by all practical purposes, but uh, don't let them freeze. Don't let them get much below 40. Stop planting ground covers. They're shallow-rooted, and they may not last through the winter because of being frozen and shifted up. So, yeah. Time is done for that. Uh, for Fred Howard, the Ohio Nurseryman, I'm Mark Noose. Thanks so much for joining us, and we hope to see you again next week for another edition of Plant Talk Radio. Plant Talk is sponsored by Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens, fpconservatory.org. If you have a question for Fred for a future show, go to our Facebook page and ask away. We value your comments about the show, so please tell us what you think by writing a review on iTunes. This helps others find out about Plant Talk. You can find out more about Plant Talk on our website at planttalkradio.com.